I've been receiving a bunch of questions lately here on YouTube and it's very hard to reply to everyone. So I decided to make this video to answer your questions. What is going on my friends? A Crystal Lim here from Mixdown Online. I'm happy to be here today. Very glad that you are watching this video. Now, before we jump in, note that I am also on TikTok and Instagram, where I kind of post more often lately. I've been posting some very cool quick tip videos <laughs> on TikTok and Instagram. So check them out and just look for Mixdown Online on TikTok and on Instagram. Everything is there. You will enjoy it, that's for sure. All right, so I'm gonna see you there also. Now to your questions. I'm gonna go and start with the first one that is in relation to the last video I released a few days ago, like a couple of days ago, uh, where I shared my top 12 mixing tips for you to use right now. Uh, and this one goes like this, and it's from David. And David is asking, Chris, get it right at the source. What if the tracks provided are the source for your mix? There is no going back and re-recording is out of the question. How would you approach your mix? Very good question, David. Um, very simple, you know, not that complicated. There's two things when I'm talking about getting it right at the source. There's the recording quality and there's the performance also, which is very important. So for example, if I'm getting tracks from a client where the recording is not that great to my standards, but the performance is amazing, you know? In that case, I have something to work with. So my approach is gonna be to focus way more on the performance of the, those tracks and use my mixing skills to produce the best mix possible with what I have to work with. Now, in the case where I get tracks where the performance is all over the place, not great at all, the live drummer is like, you know, all over the place when it comes to timing, he's not tight at all. And also the lead vocal is like super out of tune. Now, in that case, even if the recording is technically top notch, if I have like a very weak performance, I don't think I have a lot to work with. So I would rather work with a not perfect recording with a good performance than the other way around where I have like a bad performance and a good recording. So now if I'm dealing with a recording that is like badly recorded and also the performance is weak, and all over the place. Now, in that case, I would probably not mix that song and I would sit down with the producer and the artist or one of the other. I would actually tell them that the song is not ready to be mixed at this point. Now, I'm gonna have to say that on my side, the people I work with, when they send me tracks, they are well recorded and performances are usually very good. So I hope that answers your question. Let's jump on the next one. The next one comes from John. When we use the pencil tool right on the audio track to adjust volume, is that pre or post fader? Okay, so let's jump in Cubase and check this out. So what do we have here in Cubase is an audio event. So I'm gonna select the pen tool and I can with the pen tool just bring down the audio, do some kind of uh, uh, pre-gain automation. So you got it there. Everything that I'm doing here is pre-gain, is pre-insert, is pre-everything, all right? So what I'm doing here on the audio event when doing those moves is gonna affect the, uh, the level of the audio itself before the audio goes through the signal chain, meaning it's gonna be affected before uh, you get to pre-gain, before you get to the inserts, before you get to the sends, and so on, and the fader also. So it's pre-inserts and also pre-fader. And it's the same as doing a clip gain, basically. So if I just go back here and I just clip gain that down or up, it's gonna do the same thing, and that will affect the initial audio. Again, pre-insert and pre-fader. The next question is from Michael, and this one is in relation to my uh, Evo 8 audio interface video, which is this one right here. That's the audio interface that I talked about in this video. And his question goes like this. Could you link two channels together to create a stereo track to double track guitars, then pan them separately? Cheers. Yes, you can, very simple, and this is uh, in the recording stage. When you're recording, I guess uh, what he's trying to do is to record a guitar amp with two microphones and just record that as a stereo track straight on um, straight on the uh, the interface itself so he can use the same, the same parameters, like the same volume, the same gain level, and so on. So, uh, yes, very simple. On the Evo 4, uh, what you need to do is just to link them together. You can do that 
that straight from the software itself. Let me plug that in and show that to you right away. And then open the mixer, the Evo mixer. Uh, what you do is uh, on mic one and two or three and four, you can actually link them together so they act as stereo channels. So you just click on mono or stereo and there you go. Now channel one and two is going to be a stereo channel. In Cubase, what you'll need to do is to go into audio connections, go on input, make sure your stereo in is uh, routed to input one and two, which it is right now. And just create yourself a, a two mono tracks. And those two channels are gonna be used to record your guitar amp by using two microphones. So the first mic is gonna be, uh, is gonna go on the first track. You just click on mono in and you select stereo in, which is the stereo channel left, which is gonna be channel number one. And for the second track, you do the same, but you select stereo in right. Now the microphone plugged into the first channel on your interface is gonna be recorded on the first track right here on the stereo in left. And the second microphone plugged into channel two out of your interface is gonna go through stereo in right. And there you go. And you'll be able to pan them as you want. They're gonna be independent from each other. And this is actually what I would do if I was to record two microphones on one amp. I would record them on two separated channels. So I hope that helps. Let's go to the next one. And this one is in relation to the uh, how to prepare your recordings for mixing video that I released. I think it's two weeks ago. Link is gonna be on top anyways. Nice video, but I still have one question. What about phase correction? Do you correct phase before the editing stage or do you let the mixing engineer do it himself? Good question. Actually, I'm gonna work phase out during the recording. So when I'm recording tracks, especially drums, if I'm micing a guitar with two microphones or any sources that I record with more than one microphone, I am gonna fix the phase and work on the phase right away while recording. So it sounds good right away. Now I'm gonna fine tune things in uh, during the mixing stage that I'm gonna do. If I just wanna just tweak that up, uh, especially with drums, it's gonna happen that I'm gonna go even deeper. But if I need to fine tune some phasing issues that I have in my recordings, I'm gonna do so during mixing. When I receive tracks from a client to mix, I always check for phase issues for instruments that were recorded with more than one microphone, especially live drums. I always gonna take some time to check all the phasing issues, even if on paper, everything looks okay. I'm still gonna tweak things out and test things out with the polarity option, you know, switching the polarity of the overheads opposed to the snare and so on, checking if it sounds better one way or the other. I'm always gonna check for that. If everything is good, I'm gonna move forward. If not, I'm gonna fine tune straight into the mixing stage. So basically pay attention to phase issues when recording an instrument with more than one microphone and fine tune the rest during the mixing stage if needed. Now the next one comes from Alain. This is gold. I think a link to this should be included in your mixing course as a reference. Yes, Alain is part of my ultimate Cubase mixing masterclass that by the way, is gonna be relaunched next Monday. Make sure you're on my mailing list and I'm also leaving the link down below because there's gonna be like a kind of a discount good for only one week. His question goes like this. If you captured a live drummer, would you be sending to the mix engineer stamps that includes all the bleeds? Is it his or her job to remove the bleeds or would you take care of that before you send it off? This one is also related to the prepare your recordings for mixing video that I released a couple of weeks ago. Now to answer your question, Alain, I don't edit out the bleed whatsoever when editing a recording. I'm gonna leave that as is. Bleed is part of the drum sound and I'm gonna leave that to the mixing engineer, which, you know, in my case is myself, to decide to make like the, uh, the mixing decision to keep the bleed or reduce the bleed or just get rid of the bleed. This is gonna be a mixing decision depending on the full mix. But I always keep the bleed on before hitting the mixing stage and I decide after if I wanna cut it off, reduce it or keep it for a more of an organic sound depending on the genre of music I'm working on. And same if you send your recordings to a mixing engineer. I don't know of any mixing engineer that is gonna complain about receiving a drum recording with bleed on. Okay, now for the next one, this one is from Ludwig. And it goes like this, how do you balance MIDI to audio? In Cubase, I assume, very simple. Uh, let's check this out. In Cubase, I have right here a, a MIDI recording. 
Um, there's two ways you can do it. You know, it depends on your workflow. You can simply just solo the channel itself and uh, you just uh, go under file, go down to export and you export, uh, you just do an audio mix down of this solo track and that's it. Uh, so you just name your track on top and uh, what I usually do in that case, I'm gonna bring back that, um, that channel back into my session. So I'm gonna make sure that uh, I choose for file path, I choose use project audio folder. And then I make sure that the, uh, like in my case, it's a pad. So it's gonna be, uh, it's gonna be an interleave, the format, which is stereo basically. And I'm gonna make sure that after export goes to create audio track. And then I'm gonna add that to the queue, click on start queue export. Then if I don't have the same sample rate as my session is like right now, I'm just gonna click on okay when seeing this window and now I have my MIDI to audio. There's another way you can use is to select your MIDI event or several events and you click on edit, go down to render in place and then you click on the render settings. And this is gonna open the render selection window. And on top you have the mode you'll be able to choose from. Uh, I always put that to one event. Now we have the processing option here. Uh, you can uh, use dry or you can use channel settings. It's up to you. Those will do different things. If I just wanna keep the uh, the initial uh, signal of the, uh, the channel, I'm gonna keep that at dry. If I wanna include some processing that I worked on during the recording stage, let's on my sound I already have an EQ that I added compression or you know phasing effects or whatever and I want to keep those effects I'm just gonna click on channel settings and that's it I'm gonna go down select the bit depth and then uh, name the file make sure again it goes to the uh, use project audio folder because I just want to keep that in the same session and I'm gonna click on render and there you go so that's it not more complicated than that now when you bounce I'm gonna go back to the first step when you bounce you using the uh, audio export, you just need to make sure that the, the, the locators are well located, basically, um, that they locate your selection and even a bit for just to add a bit of a tail, which I did not do. And look what happened. My, the end of my, uh, uh, my audio event has been cut off. You just need to be careful when you know, bouncing using the export audio option. But render in place is actually very easy to work with. And this is actually what I usually use when bouncing MIDI to audio back into my session. Now, the next one is from uh, Dehan asking, hello, Chris, could you explain how to know which kind of VST instruments are mono or stereo? I know for instruments like acoustic guitars, electric guitars, drums, and vocals, as you said, recorded with one microphone are mono, but it's always not clear for me what to do with VST instruments. My experience is most of them are stereo recorded, but what to do if I have acoustic guitars, drums, and vocals as VST instruments? Is it the same situation as you record with one mic? What I wanna say is do we need to bounce them as mono or as stereo? This again is in relation to my how to prepare your recordings for mixing video. Video. So if you didn't watch that video, I would highly suggest you to go and watch it. Um, I explain that when I prepare my recordings for mixing, all the mono instruments, I make sure that they are all mono and not stereo. So this is a very good question. Um, the answer is very simple. Most of VST instruments out there are gonna be stereo. When you're gonna bounce them or when you're gonna render them in place, like I just did, they are gonna create stereo channels, which is okay for the most part. Like for 90% of the time, this is what I want out of a VST instrument. Now, if I'm dealing with a drum VST, uh, in that case, it's gonna depend what the drum hit will include. For example, a kick. If I'm bouncing the kick that also has a room sound with it, I'm gonna keep it in stereo. But what I usually do when it comes to this kind of effect on a drum kit is I'm gonna bounce out of that virtual instrument. I'm gonna make sure that all the, uh, the kick, snares, toms and so on are bounced without any effects. I'm gonna bounce the room effects and the overhead effects on separated stereo channels. And I'm gonna bounce the dry kick, snare and toms in mono. Now, if I only bounce them in place, in this case, if you're using uh, the audio mix down feature, you can just select, instead of interleaved, you select mono down mix, and that's it. And you bring that back into your session, like I did in the previous question. Uh, but if you're uh, using render in place, or if for some reason uh, you end up with a dry snare or dry kick uh, audio that is in stereo. So what I do in this case is I right click on my audio event, 
and I go to find a selected in pool and then right click, click on convert, convert files and then mono, make sure that the channels is mono. Click on replace file and there you go. And then I'm just gonna drag this file straight into my mixing template and that's it, you know, which that channel is already gonna be a mono channel anyways. And same for guitars, it's gonna depend on what I'm dealing with. If um, I have some effects with the guitar performance, the VST guitar performance, I'm gonna keep everything in stereo because the effect is probably gonna be a stereo effect anyways. Um, and same for acoustic guitars, it's gonna depend on the sound I'm dealing with. But if I'm dealing with a mono sound like a bass or a, an acoustic guitar VST instrument that has no effects whatsoever, I'm just gonna keep that in mono. Now I have one last question to answer in this video. And again, this is in relation to the how to prepare your recordings for mixing video. And this one is from David. And David is asking, in which project you do the edit part? in the recording one using track versions. Uh, actually what I do, David, is uh, once I'm done recording, I'm just gonna save the file as edit one or edit two or and so on, you know? So this is what I'm gonna do. I'm just gonna rename that file. I'm gonna save the session, but I'm gonna rename as a new file, like right here, I'm gonna go to file down to save as, and I'm just gonna write down edit or editing, you know, something like that. And there you go, you save that. And now I have my editing session, basically. This is exactly what I do, and this is where I'm gonna end up uh, preparing my tracks for mixing. And then I'm gonna open a brand new session, which is gonna be my mix template. And I'm gonna import the new files into this template, like I showed you in that last video. So there you go. Thank you for your questions, and I hope that those answers were helpful. Again, if you have any other questions or comments, you can leave everything down below. I'm gonna try to produce these types of videos more often because uh, they're actually pretty cool to do. And you know, it helps you out in the end, which is the goal of producing videos here on YouTube. And also don't forget to check out my TikTok channel and Instagram channel where I share some very cool quick tip videos. All right, until next time, have a nice weekend and see you.